Now I'd like to share Stanford University's land acknowledgement. Stanford sits on the ancestral land of the Muekma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. Consistent with our values of community and inclusion, we have a responsibility to acknowledge, honor, and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. Tonight, very excitedly, we welcome Jim Newman and Laura Whitcomb. And yes, we are in for a really incredible treat as they share insights, memories, and stories about the influential and famed Delexi Gallery, its artists and collaborators, and most especially, Jim Newman, who founded and opened the gallery in San Francisco in 1958. Jim's gallery alongside Ferris, founded by the remarkable Walter Hopps in Los Angeles in 1957, evolved from the tradition of underground galleries that had earlier shown influential avant-garde art in San Francisco, but maybe weren't reaching as large or sustained uh, audiences. Galleries such as King Ubu, the Sixth Gallery, East and West, and others, uh, many with ties to the orbit of faculty and students from the California School of Fine Arts. Both Newman and Hopps, who met as freshmen at Stanford University in 1950, um, expanded the art scene by promoting California art more effectively in, at Los, in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and New York. Um, they grew their audiences and thus opportunities for the remarkable painters, sculptors, writers, musicians, and others who they worked so closely with. Newman truly built a multidisciplinary community through Delexi that rattled convention, championed the unknown, and inspired new and transformative ways of thinking. In so doing, San Francisco grew into an influential art center that was contributing through its diverse artists to the mainstream of international contemporary art. You'll learn much more about this history from Jim, as well as about his time at Oberlin College, where he received his bachelor's degree in music, his extensive experience as a jazz presenter, his capacity as a film and TV producer, and his co-founding of the new music festival organization, Other Minds, based in San Francisco. We're also incredibly fortunate to have Laura Whitcomb with us. Laura is a surrealist scholar and director of Label Curatorial, specializing in shedding light on lesser known 20th century West Coast artists and their amalgamation with music, poetry, dance, film, and performance art. Laura has a deep focus on surrealism, its impact on America and its arrival on the West Coast. Originating from East Los Angeles, Laura passionately explores this era through her curatorial work with landmark venues. In 2014, she presented a light and space installation featuring prominent artists like Peter Alexander, Laddie John Dill, and Larry Bell at the Brand Library and Art Center's reopening, drawing very interesting ties to Man Ray's rayographs as a pivotal influence on the genesis of light and space. Laura's curatorial residency in 2016 at the Lucid Art Foundation preserved the works of second generation American surrealist Gordon Onslow Ford and resulted in an exhibition on the SS Vallejo ferry boat. It really was a houseboat um, and was a really significant site for surrealists and beat era artists in the San Francisco Bay Area. In 2018, Laura curated indeterminate convergences at the Center for Arts Eagle Rock showcasing artists such as Wallace Berman, Ruth Asawa, and Bruce Connor. And most related to tonight, in 2019, Label Curatorial presented the San Francisco Delexi Gallery Retrospective, spanning six galleries across Los Angeles and San Francisco, followed by the truly remarkable authored publication, Delexi, A Gallery and Beyond, published in 2021, edited by Jim Newman and the research director, Naren Dick Dickerson. It's an incredible book, and fortunately, for those of you in the Stanford community, it's available through the Stanford Bookstore, um, along with a curated selection of other related titles. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but it is worth it. Um, Laura's latest publication, Paulina PV, Ethereum Channeler, uh, from DAP in 2023, edited by adjunct LACMA curator Dr. Eileen Susan Fort, focuses on channeler artist Paulina PV, who happened to have a solo exhibition at Stanford University Art Gallery in 1934. So before I turn it over to Laura and Jim, I wanna extend great thanks to both of you um, and to Lanisha Brown, who is the Anderson Collections um, Engagement and Events Coordinator 
um, for your great work bringing us tonight's virtual program, and to Naren Dickerson for your incredible collaboration on the tonight's presentation. Um, and lastly, um, if you're interested in asking questions of the presenters um, during the program, we ask that you submit those through the Q&A function um, below at the bottom of your screen. Um, the Q&A will be monitored throughout the event, and we'll do our best to answer questions time uh, willing at the end. Um, and just to avoid, avoid interruptions during the program, we ask that you remain muted and keep your video off during the program. Um, and with that, please, um, let's welcome Laura and Jim. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome, Laura. Okay. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here to to be uh, uh, virtually back at Stanford, where I uh, attended one year from fifty to fifty one, and where I met uh, Walter Hops. We became good friends and colleagues from that time forward. And uh, each went on to uh, uh, do important things for the arts. And uh, how are we going to proceed? Are you going to ask questions, Jason, or? or uh... Well, let's move to the next slide and then maybe Laura, you can. Um, um, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, Laura, you're muted, just so you know. Oh, sorry about that. Perfect. I didn't realize I was muted. Um, thank you, Jason. And um, just a, a thank you to the Anderson Collection at Stanford University. Um, it is a great pleasure to present this story, which I think is, it. California is familiar with the histories of Delexi and, and Ferris, but I think this will be the first time we really tell the story of Jim Newman and Walter Hopps meeting at Stanford, of which Jim just mentioned. And um, I, I would like to just say that we are going to cover the parallels between each of these two friends, uh, their interests from uh, jazz, uh, photography, poetry, film, um, it's, 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 it's so extensive, but really what brought them together was the convergence of, of, of music and art of which they started, um, to discuss at Stanford. Um, so, um, because there's so much to cover, we're just going to try to quickly go through these slides as much as, uh, as, as, as fast as we can. But Jim, um, was there, um, do you mind just recalling, um, how you met, um, Walter, who went by the name of Chico um, uh, at, at the time, um, and Jim might refer to him as uh, as Chico on occasion here, so. Okay. Well, uh, Chico and I were uh, freshmen at Stanford in, in the year 50 and 51. Neither of us uh, stayed beyond that year. Uh, we happened to meet in, in a room in the dorm where we lived uh, uh, around a pool table uh was upstairs and uh we started uh i don't know it somehow it came out that we were both very involved in jazz and and had spent a lot of time listening and attending jazz performances and and uh so that's really the basis on which we our friendship uh began and we would uh, on occasion drive up to San Francisco uh, to the Blackhawk Club where Dave Brubeck uh, was playing on a, uh, regularly on Sundays uh, with his trio and octet. It's a remarkable uh, experience and which led to my uh, involvement with Dave over the years, particularly uh, when uh, I brought him as a student at Oberlin the following in 53, actually. Uh, he, he performed with his quartet, Finney Chapel, famous jazz at Oberlin uh, recording was made there. Um, Excuse so, me, Jim, we, we have some images. Um, if, okay, if we go let's to the go next on to slide, the next, we, next slide. If we could just go back um, to, um, to just go back to your, your um, your background in 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 Omaha, Nebraska, and okay. if, if you want to just 
after <laughs> your, your meeting with with Walter, we just want to give a sense of of just the parallels that you both had with jazz. So if you could just speak about um, your your early years, your early years briefly, and then we can um, okay. draw a parallel with Walter Hops. Well, I'm from Omaha. I grew up there. I went to school there before going coming out to Stanford. And uh, I played in in the jazz band at at, uh, at my high school, Central High School. Uh, studied saxophone there, and uh, that was essentially my uh, beginning, my involvement with jazz. Apart from the fact that one of the great memories I had was uh, going to hear the um, Dizzy Gillespie Big Band at a uh, club in North Omaha called the Dreamland Ballroom which was in the uh, black section of Omaha. And uh, it was a place I would go to repeatedly over the years. Heard uh, Dizzy's band there maybe three times and quite a few other remarkable performers as well. Uh, so that was my beginning with music. And uh, after and graduating, can... go ahead. We can go to the next slide. Um, yeah. We we just um, wanted to remind everybody that uh, Walter Hops uh, came from Eagle Rock, and also his very good friend Craig Kaufman, who Jim would would um, get to know. And Walter uh, was also an aficionado of jazz, going to some of the the clubs in um, in Central Avenue here in Los Angeles. But mm -hmm. um, when when you two met how did the and if we could go to the next slide as well please um i also would like to point out that that walter had as a student at eagle rock high school had a field trip to walter and louise Aaronsburg, who were the premier collectors and had one of the most notable salons in new york and they had come to california with a collection that was just unrivaled and unparalleled i mean you can see the the dali the the duchamp there i mean and and to your right is a Brancusi that had transformed a young Walter Hops, and and they were very taken with the fact, and and they almost guided him to, on how to see art and how to experience art, and to not look for meaning, and let your unconscious give you meaning. And I wonder, Jim, um, do you recall any? And it's so long ago, but do you recall any conversations initially that bonded you, uh, aside from jazz, but with art as early as like 1950, 1951? Well, uh, following our year at Stanford, uh, Walter paid me a visit uh, to my home in Omaha, stayed with uh, in our house with our family. And... Um, I think it was the only, as far as I know, the only time he was ever there, but we did pay a visit to the art museum, the Jocelyn Art Museum in Omaha. And he knew that they owned a Jackson Pollock painting. And so we made a point to see that painting. And uh, that was essentially probably my interest, my introduction to uh, contemporary art through Walter and that Jackson Pollock painting which I uh, um, saw, he and I saw together at the, at the museum in Omaha. If um, we could go to the next slide. Yeah. Um, so Jim, um, when you two started really um, adjoining your passions for, for jazz and art, um, and we might jump ahead because I think some of um, your visits to the Sixth Gallery might have been in 1956, but you were, can you recall just some of the shows or, or some of the events that you were seeing in San Francisco with, with Walter or that are particularly memorable for you? Uh, are you talking about art shows? Well, on the screen, we have some of the announcements of the Sixth Gallery. We have wow. like a performance of the Six, and and just going to the Blackhawk. You you um you were speaking about going to the Blackhawk um, later, but I I wondered if you could uh, recall any of any of the time that you and Walter were seeing shows 
um, during the period before uh, Sindel, Sindel Studio started or, or Ferris was established? Well, uh, Walter and a few of his friends in LA, uh, along with me, and I had already left <clears throat> for Oberlin College, uh, formed uh, an organization called the Concert Hall Workshop. And it was essentially going to be a, a, a building that Greg Kaufman had designed. We were looking for property uh, in the LA area. Of course, this never happened. It was a, a a wild dream. But anyway, um, this was the basis uh, for for all the jazz concerts that we worked on together. Um, I at Oberlin and a few in LA that were organized by Walter and Craig and other people. Um, we we actually have a, a slide, if we could go to the next slide oh. of um, Concert Hall Workshop. And these are some of the, um, the, right. the, these were created by Craig Kaufman and this was provided by the, uh, the Craig Kaufman Estate and Frank Lloyd, um, who was also always really helpful. We're really appreciative. Uh, so well, Craig designed these for the uh, Rubat concerts at Oberlin, the two on the left. And yeah, and the one on the right was the 54 concert. And the one on the far left was the 53 concert that was more memorably recorded and released by Fantasy uh, Jazz at Oberlin. Oh, can we go to the and next was, slide? Yeah, Just... that became the beginning of the Oberlin Jazz Club, which I was a co-founder of, which still goes on, still exists. Okay, Sindel Studio. Oh, sorry. Can we go back one slide, please? Because that corresponds 19... to... So, sorry. Okay. Um, Jim, these are some of, um, uh, this is one of the projects that you did at Oberlin um, during right. that time that you were just speaking of. So we just wanted to have an image up while you, while you were um, noting that. Yes, and you can see on the, uh, on the center, my name, uh, Oberlin College, I got into trouble for uh, identifying myself sort of as representing the college. And I was called into the the dean of the uh, conservatory there, and uh, he he uh, said I should never have done that. Uh, they wouldn't let Dave play a conservatory piano during his concert. We had to make separate arrangements for that, and uh, that that's the history. Now Oberlin is is a leading center of of jazz education. They have a, a building devoted to jazz now and uh, students that that, uh, that uh, master in, in jazz education and jazz performance. And uh, you had also um, spoken of, if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, this, if we, if we, we don't need to play the video yet, but if, um, would you like to discuss Sindel Studio, which you had established? Well, I just noticed that you had uh, something, the photo that was uh, courtesy of Phyllis Kessel, who was Craig's uh, first wife. Yes. Uh, Phyllis, and she was very much involved in the, the, this early period with us and ended up marrying a, a j famous jazz musician, a guitarist, Barney Kessel, who died a few years ago. Uh, but the, that's uh... and she was involved in the merry-go-round show. Uh, she had she had gone with um, very much, yeah. Greg, yes, to to choose work in San Francisco. Would you um, like to just tell the public um, how important the merry-go-round show was, even though you weren't at, um, yeah. attending? While I was still at Oberlin. Um... Chico and Craig and a few other people uh, became very much involved in the San Francisco art scene. They would travel to San Francisco, and that's when they first met many of the artists that later showed at both our galleries. Uh, Wally Hedrick, Jay DeFeo, uh, Sonia Gektoff, Jim Kelly, Roy DeForest, uh, and... Uh, there was a picture of Craig, I think, in the former slide with a man named Ralph Case, who was a painter who was also part of the Merry-Go-Round show and actually was 
our main connection in San Francisco to all the artists. He knew them all and he took us around to the studios. Um, so where do we go from there? So the, oh. the merry-go-round show was organized uh, in, uh, for the San Fran Santa Monica merry-go-round on um, and was probably the beginning, the exhibition that started the movement that led to Ferris and Deluxe Galleries. Um, and if, heard, go ahead, me, Laura. If we could um, play the excerpt um, of the um, from the, from the documentary, The Cool School, which it, which highlights Ferris, mm -hmm. um, if that would be all right. Um, sure. In 1954, Walter sold his collection of stamps and war bonds to help start an avant-garde art gallery in West LA called Sindel Studio. So this is Sindel before Ferris. So we just wanted to quickly um, show that. But if we could go to the next slide and then which- In 1954. Oh, I'm sorry, the next slide. Yeah. Four. In 1954. So this is, um, this is actually, um, we were discussing the merry-go-round show. And of, of course that's the Santa Monica Pier. And the this is uh, just, some of the ephemera and this is the list of artists some of which um jim was was mentioning the list of uh bay area artists that that were included in the in the merry-go-round show um of course it was it became known as action one and um yeah if we could go to the next slide and of course this is the beginning of ferris um jim would you want to discuss your involvement in the gestational beginnings of ferris um which aren't so well known but are important well i was in san francisco by this time this was in 57 that uh chico and ed keenholz opened ferris on la sienica boulevard and i think uh, for a few years, uh, well, they ran it for one year, and then then uh, Ed left, and eventually, well, uh, Irving Blum became uh, Walter's uh, partner in the Ferris, and it went on until '57, by which time Walter had left the gallery. Uh, it was uh, it became famous. It still is. It was uh, the subject of uh, Morgan Neville's documentary. Cool school. And we actually are going to play um, a quick sample from um, in the next slide, if we could please go to it. OK. So we can play these both at the same time. And this is um, one of the excerpts from the cool school. Along comes a, a little bitty gallery in the back of the back that showed uh, San Francisco and LA abstract expressionists and, and assemblage artists, which was radical. Well, first of all, it was the first gallery to show the Bay Area artists uh, on such a scale to give solo shows, you know, to take big paintings and put up big shows of the work. Now the first show is an extraordinary show of Californians and uh, not a single thing sold. <laughs> well, there was something about Walter that really wanted somehow to bring things to the public. It was something that he, he loved doing and, and felt a kind of conviction about it. The thing that's hard to imagine today is what a microcosm the whole art world was at that time. I can compare it to the surfing world. I think I knew every surfer that existed in 1950. I think I knew every artist that existed in 1957 or 58. It was just that small. California was raw. No one gave a shit out here about the artists and what they were doing. Of course, we all thought we were great. Walter was always in the background of these things. He was the one letting everyone know who were the artists worth looking at. He was like the explorer who comes back and reports on his discoveries. 
And there was there was a bit of um, Keenholz on the on the left that might if if you would like to play just really quickly, or we could even skip that the the video on the on on the left. Um, I don't know why it's sorry. Uh, Jim, is there? Um, uh, oh, here we go. It's it's a silent, but. Um, Actually, I, I never asked you about uh, Ed Keenholz. Um, I mean, did you? I mean, of course, you were so close to Walter. But what what were what was your? Um, I mean, how well did you know Keenholz? Um, I mean, obviously. Well, I knew Ed uh, not not really well because I was in San Francisco and he was in L.A. He may have come through San Francisco several times and uh, would we'd get together, but uh, uh, I saw a number of his shows at Ferris and uh, sort of paid attention to his career <laughs> as it went on and on. Great. We could go to the next slide, actually, please. Um, so what's really incredible and so important is the crossover of artists that both uh, Jim Newman and Walter Hopps were passionate about. So Jim, um, here is the one of the first group shows at at Ferris and and your first uh, group show, um, and and really um, so many of the artists uh, on on the the Ferris list alone. So Nyegektov, Hazel Smith, uh, Julius Wasserstein, Jada Feo. I mean, these were all artists that that you sh um, show like showed it in in your early years. So I think. Um, at 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 what point did you and and Chico Walter start discussing possibly sharing programs? Oh, from the beginning, uh, from the time he opened Ferris, and I went to a number of the openings there, uh, and uh, we stayed very close and in touch. And uh, it was the following year that I opened Alexi with Bob Alexander, who had also been involved with Ferris. As a matter of fact, all of these announcements were printed by Bob for both galleries during the early years uh, by hand. <laughs> they were all made on a hand press that he, that he had, and he was very good at that. Um, we could go to the next slide. Yeah. Um. So, these are some um, pages from the actual D Delexi publication that Jim Newman edited. Um, this is Richard Diebenkorn, who was in one of the, the first shows. We can go to the next one. Um, a, a fir the first group show of Ferris, and also Jim had Diebenkorn in a group show. But these artists, um, Ed Moses, we can go to the next slide. Uh, this, is, this is Ed Moses, who showed uh, had solo shows. At Ferris and Alexi. And we also, um, because we wanted to include the Moses from the Anderson collection, just to remind everyone um, that the Anderson has one of the most uh, powerful collections of, of the artists that were part of the Ferris and Alexi stables and the projects that uh, Walter Hopps and June, Jim Newman went on after the, the closure of their galleries. Um, just a quick mention that we're going to see some of Jim's work in film and the Anderson included uh, Space is the Place, which is with the Criterion Collection recently in their programming. Um, would you like to speak about Moses, Jim? What can I say about Ed? Ed was a, a great painter. He died a few years ago and, and he was in his late 90s already. And... Uh, we had great times together. Uh, I loved his work always. Um, he had a number of shows in, in LA and San Francisco over the years in different galleries. Um, and he took over your apartment. Um, yeah, in, he, at the, yeah, in the Fillmore early on in those years. He, he well, it was on Fillmore, not in yeah. Yeah, um, on Fillmore. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> Painterland. 
Yeah, uh, it became known as Painterland, still is. It, many of the, or a great number of the artists lived there over the years, and, and I I spent time there myself. And uh, We can and, go to the next slide just to um, be mindful of time. Um, yeah. This is uh, Jada Feo, who Jim gave... Um, one of her most notable um, shows at Delexi, but she also showed at Ferris. Um, Jim, would you like to speak of Jim? She only had a one person show at Ferris. She did have her first gallery show uh, with me and where she was discovered by Dorothy Miller at the Museum of Modern Art and was invited to participate along with Wally Hedrick, her husband in the 16 American show in uh, 59, I think it was. So let's go to the next um, image, please. This is the Jada Fayo and the Anderson collection. More recent Jada Fayo work. Yeah. Next. So um, being that um, this is the centennial of Sam Francis and the Anderson is featuring Sam Francis, uh, we wanted to highlight Sam Francis who um, uh, actually was in a group show at Delexi, but also Jim showed Muriel um, Francis who was, um, one of Sam Francis's first wives. Uh, and um, Jim showed a, a number of women, obviously Jay DeFeo, Deborah Remington, and, and a few uh, lesser known artists. But would you like to recall Muriel, um, Jim, who was a good friend of yours? Muriel was a great friend of mine and lived here. Uh, she unfortunately uh, passed away a number of years ago. Uh, she had uh, Parkinson's. But Muriel was uh, a good artist. I showed her only once. Uh, she was in a two-person show. Um, yeah. With, well, let's, with a we can go to the next slide. Oh, name sorry. I can't recall. Anyway. <laughs> we can go to the next slide. Um, and uh, this is um, Manuel Neri. And there's another slide coming up. Um, of, of, and this is, Jim, would you like to um, sp speak of Neri? Uh, Manuel is a, a wonderful artist whom I knew from the beginning and gave only one show to him. He, he went on to other things. Uh, the piece on the left was in his show is now in the collection of the uh, UC Davis Museum. Uh, yeah, uh, a, a really important artist who unfortunately uh, is no longer with us. Great and friend this, too. And this is a work from the Anderson on on the right. If we could go to the next slide, next. Um, so this is uh, Alan Lynch, who uh, is one of the lesser known artists from this um, famous uh, Ferris. It's called the Cool School uh, photo for many. Um, he's the artist that nobody knows. We have um, Al Altoon, Kaufman. I'm sorry, I can't see the full photo, but it's Moses. You might, uh, 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 Keen Hulse, um, who's, I can't see the, the, the I need to, uh, I can't Irwin. see the two figures on the right yeah, on this video screen, but, but Alan Thanks. is, um, featured it here. And he he was the one artist that was a, a, a very important artist at Ferris that uh, was was lesser known. And the Delexi project, um, Jim was able to uh, really work with Rosemary Mano, his widow. And Jim, would you like to um, just speak of, of Alan Lynch's in, important um, influence for these artists and and just and, and what he was like at the gallery for, for the gallery? Well, uh, uh, Alan was a Zen Buddhist uh, scholar and adherent and influenced a number of the Ferris artists in that and pursuing that that discipline and a, a great collector of, of Japanese ceramics, one of which is shown here. Uh, and uh, I think uh, he wasn't known as a Ferris artist. I don't think he ever had a one-person show there. He was shown in group shows there. Yeah. Uh, but he moved to San Francisco at one point and had two shows with me. Uh, the piece on the left 
being one of his works that I showed. Um, every one of these artists is deceased, unfortunately, in this picture. Everyone. Yeah. The most recent being Bob Irwin. Oh, right, of course. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and we're going to be um, uh, showing a work of Bob Irwin um, shortly. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So um, one of the artists in the photo, John Altoon, um, would you like to recall? Any John had uh, one show with me during the first year of my gallery in San Francisco. Uh, I think he later showed with Ruth Bronstein's gallery a number of times. Uh, a really good painter, made extraordinary drawings and a great guy. We can go to the next slide um, just to keep things moving. So um, many of the artists uh, were shown um, and, 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 and many of the artists that we just showed are in the Anderson collection. But these are some of the artists that were in the Ferris and, um, and were shown at Ferris and Alexi that are important Bay Area painters. Sonia Gektoff, uh, Julius Wasserstein, and, and, and James Kelly. Um, Jim, um, would you uh, like to speak of, of any of these three yes. artists? Uh, these are probably the first artists that I met after moving to San Francisco, all of them, all of, all of the ones depicted here. And uh, pretty much uh, formed the, uh, the core of my gallery from the beginning, along with many others, of course, but uh, this is where I began, you know, with abstract expressionism and these, these people and uh, went on from there, many other things. And Sonia Gektoff um, had this had two solo shows at Ferris, correct? Um, she was the second show after so. the notable group show that we showed. So um, she was uh, a woman that was really highly regarded at, um, in these years. If if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, a very so difficult relationship with Irving Blum, who after he took over Ferris, got rid of the San Francisco artists that. Uh, Chico had brought to Ferris from the beginning, and she she hated him. Boy, she really. Uh, anyway, yeah. I ain't going to any more of that. Well, um, Regan Projects has recently done a show of Sonia Gektoff um, here in Los Angeles, and so. Oh, Hopefully, that's great. Um, yeah, I didn't know that. We'll start seeing um, some more of her work, which is so compelling. So um, another uh, thing we wanted to point out about the reciprocity of the programming between Ferris and Alexi is just, I, I just wanted to give an example of, of what is a strong sense of, of critical New York artists, both you and Walter were familiar with and were discussing possibly when you were discussing possible co-programming um, that you wanted to include. I mean, naturally, um, this this list of, of Milton Resnick, who you eventually showed, uh, Rothko, Motherwell, Franz Klein, Hans Hoffman. I mean, these are these were all being discussed in a in a letter, but um naturally you went Although this didn't happen and Ferris showed some of these artists and, and you had a, your own New York show, which we're going to see in the next slide. Um, next slide, please. Um, and of course, this is the the Delexi uh, 46 works from New York. It's it's just a very um, powerful roster. Uh, and Jim, would you like to recall um, uh, your memories from from putting this show together? Well, it was something that a lot of fun to do, and and I remember it quite well. Uh, I don't know how well attended it was, probably pretty well. Um, yeah. There are famous can... artists and less famous artists included. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, I mean, even like Neil Williams, Jack Youngerman, um, John Wesley, I mean, these are, uh, 
they're not as well known as Barnett Newman and de Kooning, but I mean, still this entire roster of artists is, is, is really. Yeah, Neil came, came out of the San Francisco uh, Art Institute from, and went to New York from here, actually. He was uh, very, very well known as an artist here before he left. Right. Particularly well, among artists. <laughs> if, if we could go to the next slide, please. So I, we're just highlighting here um, some of the more uh, notable artists that did show at Ferris that didn't show at Delexi. Um, we have uh, Philip Gustin, Clifford Still on the left, Ellsworth Kelly in the center, um, David Park to the right, and um, Joseph Albers. Um, and and although these artists you didn't show, we wanted we wanted to just kind of include. Um, just a good example of of of, of Walter's um, profound, also profound understanding of of, of the relevance. Because well, I just see artists... curiously that uh, Ferris had this show that included uh, some of my artists, uh, Les Carr and Alan Lynch. Yes. Uh, Fred Martin, uh, Irving Petlin. Yes. Uh, Yes, of all of these artists it's that, well, yeah, I mean that's it. So many years have passed, but but it's so important to that to just to be reminded of, right. of the reciprocity between the galleries. Yeah, um, can we go to the next slide, please? So, uh, somebody just popped up a question um, uh, about your. Uh, if you had, if you had known Ed Ruscha, but we'll get to that in a second. But these are um, these are some of the artists that didn't quite make it, except for Billy Albankston in the center there, um, who was in a Delexi show. Uh, Larry Bell and Robert Irwin, um, light and space artists, uh, only showed at Ferris. And I think it's I've I've never asked you this question before, but I think I think with these light and space artists, it's almost like they needed the specific light that we have in Southern California to really engage the public of this new way of, of perception. And with the meandering fog and the, and this, the San Francisco kind of light, I, 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 I almost feel um, that they would not have uh, had the response that they, they did in Los Angeles. But was there any reason you, of course, you had Delap, who is um, uh, like, is, is, has connective tissue with this sensibility, but did you, uh, did you ever consider Irwin or Larry Bell or? No, okay. <laughs> I, mean, I, I love their work. I just didn't happen to show them. Yeah. That's um, really here and there. If we can go to the next slide. So uh, yes, yeah, so um, Walter uh, is starts um, working as an independent curator and then later the director of the Pasadena Art Museum. And uh, this is a, a very groundbreaking show, um, New Paintings of Common Objects. And, and um, somebody had, uh, I know that you would have been in San Francisco at, at this time. And if we can go to the next, uh, slide, that, was, that was the first uh, pop art show, I think, in any museum. Yes, yes. That Pasadena show before anything had happened in New York. Absolutely. And then this is another uh, show that he did with Frank Lubdell. And of course, you showed Lubdell at Delexi. If you. I didn't show him uh, uh, in a one-person show, but I no. had him in a group, group show. show. And he, was, he was a good friend. I loved his work. Yeah, he had been course. with Ferris for a number of years before then, but I and think was a teacher. He was, he was also dropped by Irving. <laughs> oh right, okay, yeah. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So we we're going to just play an excerpt um, from the Duchamp comes to Pasadena. Walter Hopps, who notably. Um, worked with Blum to show the first Warhol show and then uh, and then um the first what arguably the first pop art show gave uh, Marcel Duchamp his first retrospective so we're just going to show a quick clip of this 
And a lot of people that came to this opening, I think, maybe didn't know that much about Marcel Duchal. But some did, and some were ready for every little angle of his work. I uh, took Patty Callahan, my girlfriend at the time, and uh, I believe Julian was the official photographer for the event. Yeah, time assigned me to shoot Duchamp. I don't remember what it was so long ago. How many years ago was that? A lot. <laughs> there wasn't 25 cents between us in if we had 25 cents, we were going to the Salvation Army and buying a fancy jacket with it. We all dressed up, and uh, it wasn't short on theatrics. Larry Bell came dressed as uh, Groucho Marx. I thought I should come in disguise. And um, to me, the whole thing had to do with a laugh, having fun. And of course, that was Ed Ruscha and, and Larry Bell. Um, Jim, just how important was humor and just lightness? So many of the artists from uh, Delexi and Ferris are, are really part of major galleries, blue chip galleries and in museum collections. But at this time, um, can you just recall the atmosphere and the and the the approach and and the seriousness and the lack of seriousness and why humor just played such a vital component? Ah, oh, that's a difficult question. Um, yeah, we uh, the artists uh, were part of my uh, social circle, and that was true in LA as well. Probably more so there. I think they were a much tighter knit group of people that those associated with Ferris and mine were more dispersed throughout uh, the Bay area. And although they knew each other, they didn't socialize particularly. Um, yeah. Humor. There was always humor, right. music, humor, fun, beer. So if, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so during um, this time that Walter is the uh, becomes um, the director of the Pasadena Museum, Jim uh, has a gallery in Los Angeles, also on La Cienega. And we're just quickly showing um, some of the artists that you had. We are coming really close to running out of time. So if, if we can just skip to the next one, unless Jim, you want to comment about your gallery in Los Angeles, which lasted a year. It was a one year kind of failed attempt at sort of capitalizing what I thought was a, a good market there. It didn't happen. We stayed open for a year and then closed it. Well, but there was some excellent shows. shows, John Chamberlain and bringing H.C. Yeah, Westerman. Some great and, shows and, there. And Joe Good. Uh, Deborah Remington, of course. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? This is H.C. Uh, Westerman, who was part of that Los Angeles show and is behind um, Jason Linetsky in the uh, in in the video um, uh, at at from here at the Anderson. Uh, if we could quickly just go to the next one. Um, how would you uh, like to recall this show, Jim? Uh, this was Ron right. Nagel's first show with me. He had two, and uh, he now shows in New York and Los Angeles uh, to great acclaim. He's a wonderful ceramic artist, part of the uh, California ceramic movement uh, that sprung from Pete Volkus in the uh, 50s and 60s. Uh, to promote his show in San Francisco, he made this photo of himself with his and kissed it with lipstick on the left. And uh, <laughs> he was referred to himself as Chucky at that date. And we uh, put had these bus cards printed and put it in put them up in San Francisco Muni buses uh, with the phone number. So if you saw this, you might be inclined to call that number and then you'd get a recording that uh, Ron made of uh, about his show. 
that he was having a show at 631 Clay Street in San Francisco. Uh, Getting up to the lineages of performance art. Almost. We didn't send anything out. We didn't send an announcement out in the mail. But Ron still goes strong. He's a great person, great artist. So could next one, please. Uh, so uh, this is um, Richard Shaw. Richard Shaw, and this is when you're getting into um, taking the gallery into new endeavors like um, recording film. We're really running out of time, so we um, might just quickly need to go to the next one. Okay. Um, this, of course, is your uh, group show in, in Lausanne, if you wanted to briefly uh, speak yes, on that. Yes, my gallery, along with Betty Parsons in New York uh, and many other international galleries were invited to participate in this uh, particular special show at the Museum of Fine Arts in Lausanne, Switzerland in 1966, I think it was. And so this is a shot of that. And we have the DeLap there in front of it. Yeah. DeForest, and there's a, the DeLap from the Anderson is on the left. Um, next slide, please. Um, this, of course, is a, a page from the Delexi publication on Roy DeForest. Um, we should go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is bringing in um, some of Jim Newman's uh, projects with Anna Halperin, and also um, the fact that Charles Ross uh, did an installation with Dancers Workshop at the Delexi, speaking of performance pieces. And this also led to a relationship that resulted in the famous Delexi film series of which Anna Halperin had um, uh, created the film right on. Uh, if we could go to the next one. And we are just going to briefly hear from Steve Side, uh, who spoke about the Delexi film series that, that Jim created upon the closure of his gallery with the Delexi Foundation. There was a growing interest in television because television, uh, you know, as we all know, was um, kind of invading the living rooms of America and and uh, functioning in many ways as a behavior modeling um, system that, uh, uh, you know, uh, artists, cultural workers uh, really looked upon as a kind of invading corporate force, you know, that was insinuating itself into our lives, shaping cultural attitudes. And so what better place for artists to be than in, you know, contestation to this kind of force. But you couldn't get into the living rooms of America. There really was no such thing. The arts would appear on television and it would be the symphony, the opera, uh, it's enough. dance, you know, ballet. Uh, but rare uh, was there an, uh, an occasion for the avant-garde to, to find their way in leaving the gallery space, which was a nice, safe, kind of uh, predictable place for video space was actually a kind of crazy concept that Jim came up with in 1968. We can meet metaphysically through the use of this screen. Uh, another work uh, that appears is called Right On. Um, it's a work that involves Anna Halperin and um, the Dancers Workshop. Uh, in uh, 1968, uh, she was commissioned to do a work that became known as Ceremony of Us, which was her dance group, the Dancers Workshop, working with Studio Watts, uh, uh, an all African-American dance company in LA. Ceremony of Us would be put on at the Music Center in Los Angeles soon after this work. But what she did was she kind of uh, workshopped it in LA and in San Francisco. And then they made a document looking at the, the process of these two uh, uh, dance companies coming together and trying to learn how to work. So, and then if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, <laughs> One of the films was uh, William Wiley and Robert Nelson. Um, and we selected this William Wiley from the Anderson. And Jim, if you, uh, we could show the, a quick clip from it because it's it's it really has a great deal to do with Stanford, um, if you care to elaborate. 
Should we show the clip first? Well, it has something to do with, yeah, go ahead and show it. it uh... The thing that Frank, you see, the thing about Frank Albert's uh, Stanford team in those years was that <laughs> it was the first time that the modern form of the T formation was used. He's Clark Shaughnessy yeah. invented this thing. And the, uh, the defense couldn't figure it out. <laughs> see, <laughs> it was so far out. See, yeah, really, yeah, right. So that was um, Lou Welch, yeah, yeah. So uh, as part of this series, I was invited uh, Bob Nelson and and uh, William Wiley to do something, and they decided they would do a uh, something in, in the manner of the Tonight Show, a talk show. So they got a few of their friends, and they just talked about whatever they felt like talking about. And there's Lou Welch talking about the Stanford football team of the late 40s. <laughs> anyway. We can go to the next one. And this, of course, is the, um, one of the most notable of the Delexi film series. It's Terry Riley um, with Arlo Acton, Music with Balls. <laughs> We can go to the next slide. So, um, Jim, at this time, uh, Walter Hopps had uh, introduced you to Ant Farm. If you could uh, uh, speak on your relationship with Ant Farm, and we're going to just show um, a quick clip. Yes, uh, they showed up at my gallery to uh, uh, Doug Michaels and Chip Lord uh, had come from Washington with a uh, new Walter Hopps, who was at the Corcoran Gallery at that time. And so they they just wandered in, say, we, we uh, were here. Walter said to stop by and see you. And so from that point on, we became very good friends and did a number of projects together. This is famous uh, uh, media burn. Uh, media burn. Yeah, the the their design Cadillac space car uh, driving into a, a stack of burning televisions series at uh, in the Cow Palace parking lot in 1975. I think it was. We could um, play the video. Go ahead. So we decided to found an alternative architecture practice. An underground architecture practice is how we described it to a friend. And she immediately said, like the ant farm I had when I was a kid. So first we did a uh, architectural project uh, for Jim uh, on his house to, to make a uh, squash court into a kind of uh, screening room with a projection booth. And uh, Curtis designed uh, the projection booth uh, and spent a year building it, custom making the entire, uh, you know, shaped uh, components. Uh, this was eventually used in the, uh, as a control center for Sun Ra in, in the film that uh, Jim produced a few years later. And this is Jim Newman's space. Space is the place that he produced for Sunra. There's Sunra and the ant farm. I can't uh, room. A dream <laughs> that the black man dreamed long ago. I'm actually a present sent to you by your ancestors. And Jim, if you'd like to talk about um, when you first uh, saw Sunra and and we're going to just briefly go yes. into your current animation project for Space is the Place. Yeah, the first time I encountered Sun Ra was uh, his, he and his orchestra did a concert at the San Francisco Art Institute uh, in the uh, outdoor space there. 
And uh, I was brought to it by a, a, a man named Wes Robinson, whom I met at an opening for Phil McKenna in, in the late 60s on Clay Street in my gallery. And he showed up with Sonny Simmons, who was a jazz sax player who was playing on the streets of San Francisco at that time. So about a year later, uh, he said, let's go hear Sun Ra at the Art Institute. So I did, and that was the first time I had seen him or I knew, had heard of him, but never had seen him before. And we developed a relationship and which led to our film that we did, Space is the Place. Uh, I, we can go to the next slide. Okay. We, have, we have an image of, of Sun Ra there. There you go. All right. And this and and if you speak, uh, I'm sorry, Jim. If you can speak a little bit more, um, and then we'll show your animation project. Okay. That you're in the on. center of this slide is is a uh, image from a short series of a project I'm working on now, which is an animated version of Space is the Place, uh, and it's almost complete. I hope to get it out before the public by the end of this year. But anyway, can we? See that uh, sure. piece? Now, what does transmolecularization mean? It's a very quick clip because, again, we're, okay. we're coming close to time um, right. to be respectful of, of our audience. Um, if, if we could go to the next slide. So um, we took this opportunity to really showcase the parallel interests and evolution of your both of your post-gallery careers in, in um, that both of you had interests in photographers, uh, Robert Frank and, and William Eggleston, Hop, uh, Walter Hopps had traveled with Eggleston um, and, and you had made the, the film with Robert Frank um, and and the, and the two photographers have such a, an incredible way of presenting the, at the soul of American culture at that time. So I I, right. it, I don't know if you and Walter ever spoke at this time about your parallel projects. I don't recall that we did. No. Yeah. Well, we, we can go to the next slide. In those days. Yeah. yeah. And of course. Um, uh, Towards the end of Walter Hopp's career, he uh, did a number of uh, museum shows uh, from being at the, the Corcoran, the, uh, the, the Guggenheim, the Manil, um, but uh, a, a notable show uh, retrospective of Rauschenberg. But it's re very interest, um, interesting that one of, um, an, a particularly renowned show was a retrospective of, of Ed Keenholz, who he had started Ferris with. So it's sort of this idea that he's returning um, to his own roots in, in many ways, or actually have never left them. But um, with Jim, you um, um, at this time, um, after Space is the Place and working um, with, with documentaries about Pandit Pranath, you uh, really start beginning to work with Charles Amerkanian and found other minds. And um, I was wondering if you could, we could go to the next slide and you could speak of that. Um, oh, this is uh, the beginning of uh, a documentary I did with Bill Farley, who directed it, shot in India, on uh, Pandit Pranath, who is a great master of Indian vocal music, and the teacher of uh, Terry Riley and Lamont Young. Um, it's called uh, In Between the Notes. Do you have an excerpt of this, or are you just... I think it's, is is it loading okay? Um, In November of 92, I announced- Oh, I was this is Charles with speaking. PFA with my wife, Carol Law. Jim telephoned me and asked me, is there any way he can keep me involved in music activities in San Francisco? That's when we, we started talking about, we, we should be doing something for new music because there wasn't that much going on here. In the year preceding the first festival, John Cage, who was a great inspiration to all of us, passed on. And he had a very dismissive unsigned obituary in the New Yorker. Said that John Cage could have been thought to have composed music in other people's minds. And so the idea of other minds, it just seemed to connect. And so that's when the first Other Minds Festival began. 
We had the Cronus Quartet. We had Phil Glass from New York, John Jang. Some older people, some younger people, always an emphasis on female composers, people of color. As far as I'm concerned, we need to listen to everything. Every sound is some form of intelligence and information. And what um what are would you like to share with um our listeners what projects you're working on now? Of course, your film series that um you curate um and and just this idea of bringing community through and uh, through the realm of creativity is is something that you have never ceased to engage with. Mm -hmm. Yes, in addition to the uh, animation of space is the place. Uh, I do uh, curate films in my home, which, which Jane, my wife, and I present to a group of people who we call it the uh, Upper Ashbury Cinema Club. And on many Sunday afternoons, we have a free showing of a, a great film here. Been doing that since 2011. Wonderful. Well, we are all very thankful for everything that you've given culture, Jim, in the many years. And it was it was wonderful to recently celebrate your uh, 90th birthday. Thank you, Laura. Birthday. And thank so, you for the great job you did on the book, which I hope everyone watching this either owns or will go out and buy. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, and thank you, Laura, for uh, taking us through this um, amazing journey and Jim for sharing um, so openly um, and so broadly, you know, across the many years and the many media. Um, it's just so amazing to be able to be present here and to hear, you know, all these relationships, the sense of laughter and humor that came with them, your collaborative spirit with Walter, you know, both across artists and galleries and over decades, uh, frankly, um, and just how inspiring it is to hear you um, engage in you know, these ideas across so many media for so many years. Um, and I know there's so many people who are continually interested in what you're doing now. Um, I'm very much looking forward to the um, animated Sun Ra version of Spaces the Place um, and to seeing, you know, all that uh, that you continue to produce and to share with us. Um, for one, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, and Laura, um, just you've done so much work and research, you know, into um, Jim and the gallery um, and that time period. Um, and your the, the book that you guys worked on together is absolutely amazing. And I just wanna maybe third that uh, those that haven't seen it should definitely take a look at it. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a critical work to have in, uh, in anybody's library. Um, thank you, Jason. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and thanks to everybody for joining us. Um, we had a wonderful attendance. Um, there were some questions and uh, comments along the way, and um, I think many of them were addressed during the um, during the program. Laura, you uh, you you addressed a lot of them, um, but we're getting comments about how wonderful this is, how fascinating this is. Um, congratulations on encapsulating so much. Um, so um, hear the applause uh, and hear the cheers from the audience, um, Jim and Laura, because they're definitely coming in. Thank you. And if I may, a special shout out to Noreen Dickerson, who I work with, who's I wouldn't be able to do what I do um, mm -hmm. without without Noreen. So thank you. Yeah, well, thank you, everybody. Um, we look forward to seeing you again at the Anderson Collection um, and uh, do keep an ear out for um, all that Jim and Laura are um, are producing next. So um, thank you, everybody, so very much.